Hi, everybody. This is Arkady Freckman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney, and welcome to Last Week Night Live, where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. And it's live, so you guys could just leave a comment right here, and I'll read it, and I'll answer it for you. So welcome, and thank you for being here. And, you know, please like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, and always feel free to comment on any of our videos. And a lot of people have been texting me to my number, which is the 347-566-9595. And I've been doing consultations. In fact, this week, I think I've had maybe 10 consultations. So I'm happy to do it. You know, I'll try to find the time, even though I'm busy, I'm working on cases, but I'll find the time to do it. Um, you know, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. So let me see. Um, let me see what questions we have here today. Here's a first question from Mr. Abdul, uh, Abdul Kader Hassan. He says, hello, dear attorney. First of all, I want to thank you for what you are doing to help and explain things to us. I had a crash in Iowa State on November of uh, 2023, and I was driving a semi truck with a trailer it was at night and it crashed with a tractor and it had some kind of farm equipment without the flashing lights and amber lights and it is completely broken the other party's fault i had bones broken in several places like six places oh my god i'm sorry to hear that in the left leg and they put in my uh, plates and screws for life. Is this a life-changing injury? And how much would my case um, be worth? Or how much will my settlement be approximately? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard for me to say exactly without knowing more, without reviewing the actual file. I like to review the actual case file and give you a personal consultation. So the best thing to do is just to text me, 347 Five six six nine five nine five. I could speak to you one on one, just like a chat, just like you would have with a friend, you know, over a cup of coffee. But we could do it uh, by Zoom or by FaceTime, or we could do it just on the phone. Whatever you prefer, I'm happy to do it. It's free of charge, and everything you tell me is confidential. But you know, to give you the short answer, based on what you're saying, look, uh, it's not your fault. As long as there's enough insurance from this tractor that was out there that didn't have their lights and sirens, which they do have to have, as long as there's enough coverage, if you had this um, serious open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws and six different fractures in your in your leg, that's that's terrible. That, that, could, be, that could easily be a seven figure case. I had a similar case, not with, a, not with a truck, but with a fall. And I believe that one settled for 1.4 million. And I did have a similar liability case with a truck where a truck was stopped on the Cross Bronx Expressway and um, it didn't have its lights and sirens. And that one, I believe, settled for 2.45, close to two and a half million, almost 2.5 million. Um, so, you know, but your specific case will depend on your injuries. So it's important to get all your medical records. It's important that if you have a lawyer, make sure they're a trial lawyer that has a proven record of jury verdicts. You know, not just somebody who advertises on these billboards and says, come to me, I'm such a good lawyer, but then they don't do anything, right? They're not able to go to trial. That's the worst because those guys are just, you know, basically, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> they're basically liars, right? Because they're saying, hey, come to me, hire me. But the only reason they're saying that is because they want your case because they want to settle it and make money for themselves. Um, so, you know, I don't like those billboard lawyers. What I like is the real trial lawyers. And I actually know who the trial lawyers are, including in Iowa. Actually, in Iowa, uh, there's some excellent trial lawyers. Actually, one of the trial lawyers that I work with, he's a national trial lawyer. He's actually on trial now in the West Coast. And he recently had that settlement for $26 million. I did a video about it, the one where I said uh, the plaintiff's attorneys got 32 times what the initial demand was, that was his team uh, that got that. So yeah, I mean, just reach out to me. I could put you in touch with them for a for a consultation. Just it's a free consultation. Whatever you need, you know, I'm happy to help. My goal is helping you. You know, I'm helping serious injury victims and families. And I just don't like the fact that a lot of these other lawyers are out there 
to, you know, not really to help, but to make money for themselves, which, you know, everyone needs to make money, but you don't want to do it at the expense of other people. You want to help other people and get other people what they really, truly deserve. And people don't even know what their case can be worth until they see a real trial lawyer who knows how to build it up, who knows how to put, you know, the pieces of the puzzle together and really, you know, maximize everything. So everything can be can be worth the, the maximum. Like in that example, you know, initially the plaintiff's lawyer asked for 800,000. If the insurance company would have paid 800,000, would have settled for that. But that case ended up settling for 26 million, you know? So it just goes to show, you know, th things are not always what they seem. You, it can be worth a lot more. I'm sure when you're asking for 800, you don't think you're gonna get 800. You're probably looking for like, I don't know, 500 or 400. And you're asking for 800, right? Not in your wildest dreams would you think, this case is going to settle and you're going to get a check for 26 million, but you know, it happened. So yeah. And that particular lawyer in Iowa actually, who runs the, the firm, he's had over 200 jury trials and we work together a lot. And he's actually, like I said, he's on trial now, but he had another case where he got like a verdict of 200, over 200 million in a toxic tort case. And one of his other attorneys that are in the group had a verdict for 857 million in one case, but this is, these are toxic torts like mass tort cases. They're excellent attorneys and actually their main office is in Iowa because I think he's from Iowa. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me a, just give me a text. I'll be happy to help you with that. But thank you for asking. So let's see, what's the next question here? Aziz says, hi there, Mr. Arcady, from your experience or from experience, how many pretrials are there before the actual trial? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not really like a set number. It depends where, right? Like in New York, I would say probably there are going to be at least like four or five. It even depends on the county, right? Because like in Brooklyn, they like to do, I think, about four or five. In the Bronx, they might even do more because in the Bronx, the wait to get to a trial is longer. And so since you're waiting longer, you might be waiting like three years, they can give you more pretrials. But also, I think it depends on whether the pretrial is likely to lead to some kind of fruition. And what I mean by that is like, if you guys are close in terms of the, you know, you're talking numbers, you're negotiating, if it's close and the judge thinks, hey, this is likely to settle, then okay, then let's do another pretrial. Let's do another settlement conference. Because remember, a pretrial is not an actual trial. A pretrial is just like a little meeting. It takes like 20 minutes, sometimes less, where they try to settle the case, you know? So, and if it's, if it's, um, if it's gonna work, they'll do one. But if they see, hey, it's not going to work. These guys are asking for 10 million and the offer is like 10,000. What's the point of doing pretrials? Let's just set it down for trial. So it just depends on that. But yeah, I would say in New York, usually like they'll do like four or five and, and they do a few. They do like pretrial in the sense of a pretrial conference. They also do settlement conferences. They also do something um, like sometimes they'll do an actual pretrial where they talk about evidentiary issues like are you going to have motions in limine to exclude certain evidence you know things like that that's more like a preparation or in federal court they'll do um, a joint trial or a joint pretrial order where you have to talk about how long the trial will be who your witnesses will be and it's much more um, exact and detailed in in federal court so it all depends on where but yeah usually something like that like a few okay and then Nikimi says Hello, attorney. At what point does a plaintiff's attorney file a summary judgment instead of having the defense dragging along? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that means in dragging along. A summary judgment just means that there's not a reason to go to trial because, you see, the reason you go to trial is because you have a jury, right? A jury in New York, you have six jurors. Some other states, you might have 12 jurors. And what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get those jurors to decide an issue of fact. And what that means is, you know, a factual question, right? People even say, the jury wears the robe when it comes to the facts, right? Because they are the people that decide the facts. Now, what's a fact? A fact is, who had the red light? Was it me or was it you, right? Who was at fault? Was it, was it you for having the hole or was it me for not looking where I was going, right? A fact is, how much should I get? Is it really a life-changing forever injury that I should get a million dollars? Or is it just like, should, did I have this before? Maybe it's worth much less, right? So these are all facts. 
Now, when there's no issue of fact to be decided by a jury, for example, I'm stopped at a red light, a truck rear ends me, I'm stopped at a red light. There's no reason a jury has to decide that. It's not my fault, right? The, the truck is at fault. I'm stopped at a red light. So I make a motion for summary judgment and the summary judgment gets granted, usually as to liability, because um, you can't really file for summary judgment on issues of damages, right? Because the, the, there's no way a judge, unless you want a judge to decide it, then you'd have to do a judge trial, which I don't recommend. It's always better to do a jury trial. So that's usually um, how it works. So you could do it at any time. I mean, you could file a motion for summary judgment immediately, meaning like you file a, um, a lawsuit Okay, now the lawsuit is filed. You just filed the lawsuit yesterday, a summons and verified complaint. Now, today, you go ahead and you file a motion for summary judgment. You say, look, I was stopped at a red light. I wasn't doing anything wrong. This guy rear-ended me. And you, and you can win on that. So as long as you have, like, affidavits, proof, or, you know. So that, that's basically what it is. But, yeah, I mean, but, but, yeah, summary judgment can be used to stop the defendants from dragging their feet in the sense that if a defendant is not moving, right, not offering any settlement and just kind of adjourning, if you file a motion for summary judgment, at least in New York, what happens is now the defendants have to pay you interest, right, from the date of the judgment. So if you file for summary judgment and you win summary judgment, you know, and it's a big case, let's say you have a fusion surgery. Well, okay, well now whatever that verdict will be like in two years and three years when you have the the damages trial, right? If it's like three million, well, now they're going to pay you for all that time from the date of the summary judgment decision, the order. They're going to pay you like nine percent interest. You know, it could be a lot. You know, for like a few years, like two or three years, on a big number like three million, that could be a lot of money, right? So, yeah. So then, then they get scared, and then they're like, okay, let's pay now. But why would we want to pay later plus pay interest? So in that sense, you can get them to uh, stop dragging their feet with summary judgment. Okay. And then Harley says, hey, how are you, Arcady? Very good. And Leonardo says, hello. Hi, how are you? And Ron Jers says, how much, does, how much more does a three-level lumbar fusion settle for than a one-level fusion in percentage-wise in New York? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, you'd have to really, like, research it. Remember, like, there's not really, like, cases don't really settle for procedures, right? I mean, certain procedures have certain values just based on my experience, but it's not like a fusion is worth, you know, a certain amount or like a knee scope is worth a certain amount. I mean, when people say that, it's really based on other cases that they've handled, right? And it's based on their experience. But procedures in and of themselves don't have value it's everything, right? The whole, you have to look at everything. Like what's the liability? Like, for example, if you have a three level fusion, but you know, you're going up against uh, a small policy, well then it's only worth 25,000. That's the only insurance, right? Or if you have a three level fusion, but you're at fault, let's say, you know, you ran the red light. Well, now you're going to settle it for much less. Maybe you'll settle it for like a hundred thousand because you, you ran the red light and they have a video of you, maybe even less than that. Maybe it'll get dismissed. So it just all depends on, you have to look at it like holistically. There's no way to really like say a three-level fusion. But but to answer your question, I mean, a three-level fusion, how much more than a one-level fusion? I mean, I would say considerably more, just to give you some examples from cases I've done personally, I've settled like one-level fusions for, you know, um, like 1.5 million, 1.4 million in that range. Uh, I've settled a few cases. And then the the the, th the the three plus level fusions that I've had settled for more. For example, um, I had a the, the case I did this past summer in August that was like a multi level fusion. I think it was more than three, uh, and that one settled for like three point five. So I guess in that sense, one point five, three point five, right? It settled for more because it was three levels. But I don't want you to you know <laughs> take that as what what it's worth, right? Because every case has to be done individually, and also have to look at how it affected the individual. That's why I like to do the full biography of a person, you know, and, and really tell their story, like what obstacles did they have to overcome in life before this, you know, incident, this injury. And now how are they dealing with this injury? And it's like a whole biography. It really gets in depth. And then you want to get other people, like people from their life, uh, friends, coworkers. And then that really puts a value on it altogether. So that's really, really critical. 
because you know if you're just talking about like fusion i have three levels i have one level of medical records jurors don't really care about that they don't really understand that and it's not going to like drive value by itself you have to explain how it affected the human being that's really the key thing that really you know that's what people relate to like for example like you know i used to play catch with my son or my adult with my daughter and now i can't do that anymore and that's that i lost my sense of self my identity like for example the case where i got 3.5 million one of the stories i told was him in the grocery store with his girlfriend who he wants to marry and you know he was really injured because he had this multiple level fusion in his neck and he also um had radiating pain radiculopathy to his left hand and to the point where it was going to his pinky and to his ring finger and he couldn't really hold things and he was had a partial paralysis in his hand um and it was really really affecting him and then he had this bag of groceries because he got some like pasta and some pasta sauce and he was going to make dinner he was going to try because he wants to try to do things right even though he's injured he doesn't want to just say i'm a cripple i'm just going to give up uh, you know i'm so injured he wants to try to do things and he wants to try to be a man and do this nice thing for his girlfriend like cook a dinner and then when he gets the bag and he's about to leave the store it, it falls out of his hand and the pasta the you know the glass pasta sauce just shatters and there's pasta sauce everywhere and then they say clean up an aisle too and they come and they start cleaning it up. And then he he just feels like so upset, you know, humiliated that he has to go back and get another one. And everyone's looking at him. And it's almost like a, a metaphor for, for how his life has changed. And I think stuff like that it becomes really powerful. So if you can do that in a case. But in order to do that, you have to go to, like, I went to his house uh, a few times. I talked to him. I talked to not just him, but I talked to the girlfriend. I talked to his close friends, neighbors, you know, and you really get a sense of, the person, and then you're able to drive value that way. So yeah, I hope that's helpful. But I think I really think that's the way to do it. And then lost in awareness says, why would a defense attorney cancel my deposition, but still allow his defendant to be deposed as scheduled? The defendant is 100% at fault. Hmm. I mean, if they're so they're they're canceling your deposition, meaning they don't want your deposition at all, not adjourning it, to do it later, but canceling it. So I guess that would probably mean that they just don't um, want to take it. Maybe they have enough evidence based on, sometimes you do another hearing, like if uh, if it's like a case against the city, sometimes they do a preliminary hearing, like a, um, a 50H hearing. So if you had one of those, perhaps that's why it was, they don't want another one. But I would say that's a good thing. If they don't want your deposition, you know, well, that's a good thing. And the defendant is going to be deposed. Um, usually that's as to liability. So if he's 100% at fault, like, like I just mentioned, you could just file a motion for summary judgment and get a judgment as a matter of law if you have that evidence. If you don't have that evidence and you need a deposition, well, then, you know, <clears throat> these affidavits, the other evidence of whatever you have, photographs, videos, plus the deposition, right? that's evidence too. Everything together will prove that they're 100% at fault. Then you get summary judgment. And now they don't have your deposition. You have summary judgment. You're in a great position. I would just file a note of issue or certify it as trial ready. I don't know if you're in New York or somewhere else and just push it along. You know, that could, that could be a big case. Uh, that, that sounds like you're in a good position. Okay. And then let's see. What other questions do we have here? Nikemia says, attorney, why the defendant deposed if it's not an issue with liability? Well, yeah, if there's no issue with liability, you don't have to depose the defendant. You can just go ahead and file the summary judgment motion. If that gets granted, now you have a judgment. So you don't need to depose them in that situation. But, you know, sometimes you want to depose a defendant anyway, because sometimes, you know, if you go to trial, and, you know, some, in some situations, liability issues can play into damages, right? Because the jurors want to know. Remember, the jurors are not lawyers. So, so the law, it like bifurcates everything, right? This is liability and this is damages. And they even do two separate trials. Sometimes it's the same jury usually, but two separate trials. You, the issue of who's at fault, liability, and then the issue of how much is this all worth, damages. But what you want to do in for the jury is you want to talk about the bad conduct, especially if the defendant knew 
that what they were doing was dangerous or reckless and they were likely to hurt people, but they did it anyway, right? You want to get that out there because that kind of testimony is what will get the jurors to see, wow, this is a really bad company or a really bad defendant. And then they get upset and then they'll allow for more damages, more money. And they, they you know, I've done trials and they've, they've told me that jurors have told me that point blank. And in, in fact, in this one case where we got a 500 plus thousand uh, dollar verdict, this was not a settlement. This was a verdict. I think it was five, 525 or 535. Um, you know, the, uh, the jurors said that they said, look, it was a damages only trial, right? So I couldn't bring up liability, but I kind of sneaked it in there, you know, found a way to creatively to sneak it in there and just talk about, hey, what did you learn? And then this particular lady, she learned that the defendant could have just spent a few dollars to repair the unsafe condition, but he chose not to. And so when the jurors heard that, they were like, I think they allowed for even more money. So sometimes it's all intertwined. And in a lot of places, you get um, unified trials. Like, for example, in the Bronx, in Manhattan, you get unified trials. Everything's all together. Okay. Jarmel says, hey, buddy. Hi, how are you? Great to see you. And Truth Seeker says, so glad to see you're educate, educating us. I can speak for all of us. We appreciate you so much. I know you, 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 you do specialize in workers' comp cases, but if a claim is denied and you get treatment from your primary physician, would the worker compensation insurance company be responsible for the medical costs up until the claim is accepted based on the appeal decision? My claim got denied for six months and had to treat with my primary doctor and the costs have exceeded 50K. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, I would say, look, I mean, if, if it gets approved, workers' comp is administrative. So as long as you file for workers' comp. Now, if you're working and you get injured while you're working and there is a workers' comp insurance carrier, then they should be paying for your lost wages and your medical bills. The only reason they wouldn't pay is if something happens, like, for example, they say, you know what, this is, um, this is not, uh, you know, you're, you're not really working or you, I, I don't know. I, I guess there are a few defenses, but really it's a, it's a straightforward thing. So as long it, it should be. So if you're saying you're appealing it, then, yeah, I think there's a good chance if the appeal is um, successful, right, and you win the appeal, then the workers' comp should cover your medical bill. That's what, that's what I would think. I'm not a workers comp specialist, so I would probably defer to a workers comp specialist, but I'm pretty sure that's that's how it works. And then Jonathan says, no lie, Mr. Freckman, you're the best. I'm learning so much from your videos. Keep it up. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you as well. And Vic says, hello, Arcady. Heaven sent. In my case, most of my doctors are not available for trial. What can we do? Can we go with another expert? Yeah, absolutely. If your doctors are not available, you just get someone else, like another expert to see you. Um, so, so that's probably what we're going to have to do. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, that happens. I mean, it's not, it's rare. Usually doctors are available, but sometimes doctors just, you know, have things come up like um, personal things, emergencies, and they're just not available and they just can't come to court. And sometimes you can't even know what, you know, what the emergency is, because it's personal, it could be something, you know, personal, like their, their health or health of a family member, and then they're just not available. And so you have to um, get another doctor in the same specialty and have that doctor review all the medical records and then testify. So that's usually how it's how it's done. Yeah. Let's see what else is going on here. Oh. Let's see. Nikemia says, do plaintiffs still have to prove causation if rear-ended? Um, if you get rear-ended, I mean, the cases I've had for rear-ends, I don't believe so. I believe that if you get rear-ended, you get summary judgment, then uh, you don't have to prove causation. I mean, you do have to prove damages and that the, that the injuries were caused. I mean, the injuries have to be caused by the, you know, by the, by the crash, you still have to prove, like, for example, if the defendants are going to argue that these injuries are not from the car accident, these injuries are from living your life, or you had these injuries before, then it becomes an issue in the case. But if that's not an issue in the case, you don't have to prove 
that you know the car crash caused because um, obviously if you re-rendered you he caused the accident so um, but yeah but usually it depends on the judge it depends on the uh, the county too like you have to look at the pattern jury instructions but I would say for the most part um, you, you usually don't have to prove causation of the accident you may have to prove causation of the injury like I explained like if that's an issue um, but I've had it like I think I think that's what I've had that's what I've seen um that's what i've seen in the trials i've done okay and then matthew says would you file a summary judgment on my case in federal court mm -hmm. well i mean you could file a summary judgment in federal court i don't know your case you know i'd have to i'd have to like uh know the facts of your case you know if you want me to review your case with you just feel free to text me 347 566 9595 or if you have an attorney handling it, just ask them what they think if summary judgment would be appropriate. Most attorneys should know that, you know. Um, okay, Jacobson says, do you get paid more for evidence upon evidence? Or if you are American, hmm. will the jury see you a certain way? I don't know. I'm not really sure what that means. Get paid for evidence. Evidence is just something that, you know, comes in in a trial. So evidence is something like, for example, testimony, right? Your testimony, when they ask you questions like, what happened? I got into a car crash. That's evidence, right? Photographs could be evidence. So you don't get paid more for evidence, but if you don't have any evidence, then you don't have a case, right? Because you have to have evidence. That's Evidence is just like how you prove a case. So I'm not really sure what you're asking, but yeah, I mean, now the jury sees you in a certain way. If you're American, I mean, I don't know. It depends on the jurors. I mean, obviously, some jurors might have prejudices and want a certain type of person. I mean, but then, you know, you, you, I mean, you basically, in your voir dire, which is your jury selection, that's when you're talking to a panel of jurors, prospective jurors, and you're choosing which jurors. And sometimes the jurors are choosing, you know, also, they're choosing, hey, do I want to be on this case? Because... Certain, some of the questions, like if they don't want to be on the case, they could just say, I can't be fair. Now they're off the, I mean, you don't have to be like a rocket scientist, right? You don't have to be Einstein. If you just say, I can't be fair, or I would side with, you know, this, I would side with insurance companies, for example, or I would side with the injured party. Oh, if anybody's injured, I feel so sympathetic to them. I'd give them millions of dollars. Well, now you're off the case, right? Because you can't be fair to both sides. So, yeah. So I, I would say that's usually how it plays out. Uh, so you could kind of uh, gauge that in jury selection and evaluate and then kind of decide, hey, is this going to be a good juror for my trial? And also a good attorney, what you do in jury selection is you think about not just each individual juror, but how would they work together as a group, right? You have to form a group and would, you know, who's the leader? Who's the follower? How is this group, a group of six, for example, how is it going to play out? And how is this decision uh, dynamic going to unfold? So you have to think about that. And sometimes you could be wrong. It's hard. It's not an exact science. Okay. And then Anar says, hello, I had an L3, L4, L4, L5 fusion surgery two days ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's a serious, that's a serious procedure. My truck was hit by an Amazon truck while it was parked. Will it take a long time to pay the money? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. If you just had the surgery two days ago, it could take some time, but, you know, I don't know where you are. It depends on where you are. I don't know what uh, stage your case is in, right? It depends on how far along the case is. Like if the case is already in a lawsuit, perhaps you're just supplementing. And then if you've already been deposed, you already had a deposition, they just need another deposition as to the, the surgery you had. And then you go on the trial calendar, that'll be shorter than if you didn't even file a lawsuit, then you have to start from scratch, basically, right? And file a lawsuit and go through everything. So, but yeah, and usually it takes, the, for, from the beginning, usually it could take a few years if you're looking for a, a trial. But at any point during the process, they could settle and offer you a, uh, a reasonable amount of money to settle as long as you prep the case right, build it right, and show them, look, if you don't settle, we go to court, you're going to pay a lot more. So then they're going to settle with you. So, you know, feel free to text me, 347-566-9595. Um, I'll drop it in the chat, too, if anybody is. Um, yeah. Happy to do a consult about that. 
But yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds like a strong case, though. Okay, and then Payne says, slip and fall, partially torn Achilles tendon with a PRP injection. Second MRI reveals that the tendon did not heal properly with scar tissue. Uh, Achilles tendonitis, 1 million policy, New York. Estimate of how much you think that my case could be worth. Mm -hmm. So slip and fall. So the slip and fall, see, that's, that's a key. If it's not your fault, right? If you slipped and fell because the other person had a dangerous or unsafe condition and they had notice of it, you know, actual or constructive, then that's obviously better than a slip and fall just with weaker liability. But yeah, I mean, an Achilles tendon with PRP injection and you had, uh, you said, uh, there's no, so there's no surgery, right? It's just an Achilles tendon with the injection. I mean, it's hard for me to guess what it could be worth, but I would say it could be worth in the mid six figures, uh, Achilles tendon. Um, if it's just tendonitis, that might be harder as opposed to like a tendon, uh, like a tendon. Well, I guess if it was a tendon tear, you'd probably need surgery. But yeah, it could, it could be worth. It could definitely be worth something significant like in the six figures. But again, remember, like procedures by themselves don't really drive value. It's like the overall case, liability, human story. Uh, how has this impacted your life? You know, if you have witnesses. So it's the whole enchilada. It's not just like, you know, I have a herniated disc at L4, L5. What is that worth? Well, maybe it's worth millions. Maybe it's worth nothing. Like it's not like diagnoses by themselves aren't worth anything. Um, not in personal injury. It's not an exact science. It's kind of like art as opposed to science, right? If it was scientific, like a calculus or something, you'd say, okay, this is the equation and the answer is, you know, X to the third power, whatever, like uh, 537. But it doesn't work that way. It's just more like art. You know, some people look at this art and say, hey, this is a Monet. This is worth 50 million. Other people look at this and say, I don't like it. It's not worth anything to me. I don't want it. Yeah. So it's like picking the right jury and the whole the whole process isn't exact, but I guess to, to answer your question, that's what I would say. Like just based on what you're saying, I, I would say something like that. Especially if it's scar tissue, um, yeah, I would say it's probably worth six figures. Meaning like you know two, three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand in the mid six figures. It could be it could be in that range. And then oh, the same person asks if the plaintiff files for summary judgment and summary judgment is granted, does the plaintiff automatically get the amount of money they ask for? Oh, no, no, you don't get the amount of money you ask for. No, summary judgment is on liability, right? So summary judgment is as to um, fault. So if you win summary judgment, it just means you don't have to prove fault anymore. So now the trial is only as to damages, which means that the entire trial is just answering the question, what is a fair and reasonable amount of money that will compensate you for all your harms and losses, for all your injuries, right, for your loss of enjoyment of life, that's why I say it's important to do the biography and the human story because it's not just your injuries, but it's also your loss of enjoyment of your life. So what's your life like, right? What are your passions? What do you love to do? Who do you love to spend your time with? Who's important in your life? What's important? You know, your family, your friends, your things you like to do, go to the beach, play sports, whatever it is, um, and how it's been affected. So yeah, but no, it doesn't affect um, damages. Uh, it only affects, summary judgment means that there's no issue of fact as to who was at fault. Like, for example, if you're like stopped at a red light, you get rear-ended by a car. Well, you didn't do anything wrong. You were stopped for a red light the way a reasonable motorist should be stopped for a red light. This other guy rear-ended you in the back. The other guy's completely at fault. So that's it, right? It, it's done. He, they're 100% at fault. But if you don't have any injury from this crash, you still can get zero, right? But if you have terrific injuries like brain injury, fusion surgery, burn, scarring. Well, now, as long as you can prove, you still need doctors to prove it's from this crash. But if you can prove that, hey, it could be worth a lot. If they have the insurance, it could be worth 5 million, whatever, 10 million. And they can't give you an amount just because you win summary judgments. They don't know. You have to prove that. You have to win that in a jury trial or you have to settle. But what I'm saying is because you have summary judgment, if you had the summary judgment earlier, right? You could file summary judgment immediately. So I file a lawsuit. Like say I get a new call today. Hey, I was rear-ended. I just got the call today. I filed a lawsuit today. Tomorrow I go and I file a summary judgment motion saying, hey, look, here's a video. He was stopped at a red light. Here's an affidavit. Here's the police report. You know, he got rear-ended. He didn't do anything wrong. I get summary judgment like in a week, whatever. 
then in like five years or three years, whatever, later, I do the damages trial and the jury says it's worth three million. Well, I can get interest from the date of the summary judgment, which was, you know, tomorrow or all that time, all those three years, every year, it's like eight, almost 9% against the private defendant. So it could be a big amount, right? On 3 million, you figure like 10% is what, like 300,000, right? And you're getting it for three years. So it's like an extra million you're getting uh, because you have a judgment. So I guess the law is basically saying, if you have a judgment, then these guys should be paying you and it gets the defendants to pay. Cause they're like, why should we pay all this interest? Well, we want to pay earlier, it, you know, if, if it's a case where we're going to have to pay anyway. So I hope that explains it. But yeah, summary judgment is usually as to um, liability. I mean, there are certain instances where summary judgment can be filed for damages, but that's more like as to the threshold. Usually the defendants try to file for summary judgment on threshold, meaning you don't meet the serious injury requirement. Now, a plaintiff can also file a proactive motion saying, I do meet the serious injury requirement on damages for, for summary judgment. But all that means is you meet the serious injury requirement. And the court could say, as a matter of law, you meet the serious injury. So you still have to go to trial for the jury to determine how much you're going to get. It's just that if you meet the serious injury threshold, it's like the minimal, you know, the minimal uh, uh, barrier that you have to meet. Well, now you don't have to maybe prove summary judgment at trial because you've already met it through the summary judgment motion. I don't know, but it gets a little complicated, but that, that's a that's a different issue. Uh, but usually summary judgment is for liability. Okay, and then Nikini says, my attorney did not do summary judgment. Defendants admitted fault on the police report. Well, that's good too. I mean, if they admitted fault, then you're going to win at trial. I mean, for whatever reason, the attorney didn't do the summary judgment. You don't have to do the summary judgment. It's just one, you know, it's like, like every lawyer is different. Every lawyer has a different uh, strategy. Uh, so, yeah, you don't have to. You could still win at trial. I mean, if they admitted fault, well, you're going to probably win a trial. There's also something known as a directed verdict, which means that at trial, you can have the judge say, OK, I'm going to direct a verdict for the plaintiff, for you, because there's no reason to let the case go to the jury. Right. Because remember, it only goes to the jury if there's a question mark, if there's a question of fact. And, and, and meaning like, like, you know, it's where the facts are different. Like you're saying this happened. They're saying that happened. Who's right? We don't know who's right. We have to have this jury decide who's right. But if it's so clear that they admit they're at fault, well, why do we have to have the jury decide it? We'll just direct a verdict for the plaintiff. So you could do that. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's something actually that um, actually it's funny. The first time I ever did a trial, this was like back in 1999, a long time ago. It was in Brooklyn. And I got a directed verdict. I was representing this gentleman. He got rear-ended. I think the defendant was like uh, an all-state. And they had, I uh, forgot the policy, but he had a surgery. And I was trying to get the case settled. And they were fighting me on liability. So I had to put him on the stand. And I had to cross-examine the defendant. And it was pretty much like a rear-end uh, hit. So I even, like, I even went above and beyond. I said, look, you're in your lane, right? Could you have gone to the left? No. Could you have gone to the right? Well, no, I couldn't go to the right. There was a concrete barrier. Well, could you have gone to the left? And remember, my client got rear-ended. So then the judge is like, oh, what is this? <laughs> That's it. Directed verdict for the plaintiff. Actually, he asked me, he said, uh, is there any motion that you'd like to make? Um, and then, you know, he actually helped me out. He said, before I could answer, he said, well, how about a motion for directed verdict? I was like, okay, judge. He's like, granted. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> and That's pretty cool. So that's a nice thing. Uh, he was a nice judge. I think his name was Judge Starkey. Starkey. I think that was him. I, I still remember. Uh, he, he must be like uh, passed away by now or retired for sure. But I still remember that. That was in Brooklyn. <laughs> First trial ever. So that was good. Started off with a win. Okay. Let's see what other questions you guys have. Um, Lost in Awareness says, at what stage in a case would you refuse to take over a case? To take over, I mean, you know, it depends. Uh, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't like to take cases from other lawyers. I prefer to get the cases fresh, you know, like the new cases, because I can build them up the way I like. But sometimes I will take a case, like, from another lawyer. Usually I'll take it if I feel like I could add value, like substantial value, like maybe the other lawyer is not handling the case properly, or maybe it's just languishing. And if I could take the case and I could add a lot of value, like, for example, if they have X number, but I can get double that, well, maybe I'll, I'll do it because it's good for the client, right? And remember, like the legal fee, it doesn't change, right? If you have one lawyer, you could have 100 lawyers, 
the legal fee is still a third. So if the case settles for a million dollars, the legal fee is 300,000. Now, if you had that one lawyer, the one lawyer would get the 300,000. If you had like I don't know, 10 lawyers or 100 lawyers, now all those lawyers just share the 300,000. But the client's piece of the pie, your piece of the pie is still 700,000, right? Still two thirds, 67% roughly. So it's still the lion's share. So it doesn't change. So yeah, I would say I would take over a case if I could add value. And I've done it like, Recently in a case, somebody had an offer of, I think it was 200 something. And I just felt, even though it was a tough venue, it was Westchester, we took it, we really prepped it. And then we ended up getting, I think, a 575 on the case. So almost doubled, you know, I think more, maybe, maybe more than doubled. They're not doubled it, yeah. And the client was very happy. Um, so it was, a, it, was a nice, it was a nice result. Okay, and then what other questions do we have? Nikimi says... Is pre-existing injury a big deal if you have no symptoms for over seven years? No, I mean, I, I would think it's not a big deal. I mean, look, if you, everyone has a pre-existing injury, right? So it's just a question of you take your injured person as you find him. Some people are going to be like in excellent health, like bodybuilders. Some people are going to be, you know, a little bit vulnerable, a little bit hurt. But just because you're already vulnerable, does that mean that people could crash into you or people or people could leave like holes for you to fall. No, in fact, if you're already hurt, then you have less to give, right? And it's actually worse for you. So if you're already hurt, if you already have certain conditions, it's worse for you to get rear-ended because those con conditions get aggravated and exacerbated. They get made worse. So you just can't sue for whatever you had before the crash. So that's the whole, that's the whole fight, right? Because what the defendants want to do is they want to say that you're like a fraudster, right? That you're trying to sue and get their defendant to pay for something that you already had like a year before. You can't do that. And you have to like be honest about that. You have to, you know, bring that up yourself. Don't let them bring it up because then you're going to lose. So what I do, I bring it up right away and I say, look, we're not looking for that. We're not looking for, for any payments for anything that the evidence in this trial will show that we already had before the crash or before the fall, before the incident. No, all we're looking for is compensation. And to the extent that whatever we had, whatever conditions we had, were made worse, which is what the law says. If you read the uh, pattern jury instruction, that's what it says, right? Aggravation, exacerbation to the extent that the condition was made worse. So that's what you were able to recover. Okay, and then Payne says, my slip and fall was due to a defective basketball court with a crack, uneven surface. Four months after my injury, they shut down the basketball to renovate it. I do have picks. Yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it's a crack, that, that could be a good case. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. That, that should be a good case. And then Elez says, how is a multiple injuries calculated with pain and suffering? So if you have multiple injuries, you can get compensation for each injury. It's just be, be worth more, right? Because you have more injuries, so it's worth more. If you had like one injury, it would be worth less. Like, for example, if I had a, a knee injury and I needed a uh, an arthroscopic surgery known as a scope, you know, a surgery for my knee, that's maybe worth like, I don't know, 200 or 250 right? Maybe 300,000. But if I have that, plus I have a herniated disc and I need a discectomy in my neck. Well, now the discectomy in the neck is worth maybe like 200,000 plus the knee surgery is worth 200,000. So altogether it could be worth 400,000. It's just, it's worth more. Um, I mean, sometimes they'll discount a little bit, but generally it's worth more. And then Real Tom Jones says, after a deposition, is it better to make a pre-settlement with the truck defense attorney or go to mediation? Well, after a deposition, um, that means like you were deposed. I don't know if you mean the deposition of the plaintiff or the defendant, but um, and then he clarifies, he says, meaning the truck attorney wants to make a pre-settlement or is a mediation better? Rear-ended by a truck. Well, you know, it just depends. I mean, I wouldn't go to a mediation unless they give you a good faith offer first, because I talked about that before. Sometimes what the defendants do is they say, hey, let's go to mediation. And then the only thing that happens at the mediation is they lowball you. And like, if you're looking for, let's say a million, they'll give you like 20,000. They'll just say, oh, how bad your case is and, and talk about all these problems and just be like, um, you know, naysayers. And, 
And the reason they do that, it's like a proven technique. It's like a psychological technique. They're trying to, you know, get you to get your hopes up, right? Thinking, hey, I'm going to mediation. I'm going to settle my case. And then just like dash your hopes and be like, no, we're not paying anything. It's not worth a million. It's worth 20,000. So I don't go to mediation unless they give me a good faith offer first, right? Because I, I don't want to do that. Well, what's the point? And then, and then what happens is the client gets mad at their lawyer. Hey, why'd you bring me here? And then they start fighting and then all these problems happen. But, but, but the, the other part of your question, I mean, just having them make an offer. Yeah, sure. If they're going to make an offer, just have them make an offer. And then, you know, but I, I don't know like how your lawyer is negotiating it, but that's the way I would do it is just, um, you know, uh, just tell them, don't let, you know, a lot of lawyers will just start high, right? Like, like, you know, and then, and then have the defendants whittle you down, meaning like keep going lower and lower and lower until you get to the bottom line and they'll say, Hey, what's your demand? And I don't like that. I don't like the whole word demand. I don't like that whole process because what's the point of me starting high? Like say, for example, I want to settle a case for 300,000, right? So that means I have to ask for a million when I know it's not worth a million to, to get. And then they start whittling me down. Oh, a million is so high. We'll give you 50. Okay. I'll come to 950. Okay. We'll give you a hundred. Okay. I'll come to 850. Okay. We'll give you 125. And then I'm trying to get 300 that way. I don't like to do it. What I like to do is say, look, this case is worth 300. Pay me the 300. You have 30 days. If you don't pay me the 300, that's totally fine. But just know that after the 30 days have expired, that train has left the station, right? It's like yesterday's weather or yesterday's whatever. It'll never come back. So now it's going to be like 450. And so to, to do whatever you want to do, you want to give me 300, you want to give me a fair offer against the 300, like 275, we could settle it probably. If you don't, then fine, but it'll be 450. And if I have to do a, a jury selection and I have to do an opening statement, well, then it'll be, you know, it'll be 750, you know, and you, and you just lay it all out for them. And they, they hate that. It makes them go crazy. And it always leads to something and they, they pay you more money because now you're in command, right? You're calling the shots. You're saying what it's worth. You're not uh, letting the defendants control you because that's what they love, right? They love to control you. They want to be the puppet master and you, you're the puppet. Don't be their puppet. You know, you be strong. You, you tell them what, what it's worth. Uh, have your lawyer tell them what it's worth. That's the way I like to do it. That's and like all over the country, that's how. That's the same way these guys got twenty six million on an eight hundred thousand dollar offer. You know, because they, that's what they did. They said first they thought it was eleven million, so they said pay me the eleven million. And those guys said no. So then they're okay. Well, well, what else do you have? And meanwhile, they're not just asking for money, right? They're also prosecuting the case and they're taking depositions of the the people. In that particular case, there was a guy who knowingly like falsified. Uh, the chlorine levels in a pool and the, those levels were so high that it was burning children. And, you know, and then they asked his supervisor, well, what do you think about the fact that this guy is saying the normals are, the, the, the levels are normal, but they're not normal. They're, they're like burning children. You know, what do you think about that? And then the supervisor goes, I don't care. So now they have all that testimony on video, you know, and it's so powerful. If they went to trial, they probably got 50 million. You know? So, but, so that's what I'm saying. Like, it's not just asking for money. It's like, give me money. You know, it's good to be aggressive, but you also have to have a case, you know. So they had both. And, and the way they do it is when they say, hey, pay me whatever amount, then they have it like, so once those 30 or you know, it could be 30 days, it could be 60 days. When that opportunity is open during that time, what they're doing is they have certain, you know, um, important things like depositions or medical evidence or certain things that are going to get the insurance company to think, start thinking, oh, maybe we have to pay this, you know? So it's like, it's like a whole sequence. It's like you're, pl you're planning everything out for those 30 or 60 days. So no, it's really, it's really smart. Okay. Let's go to some other questions. Um, Eric says, do you know the average settlement for a workers comp case that required a micro discectomy? Yeah, I mean, a micro discectomy, like if you're talking about a third party lawsuit, you know, like I don't really do workers comp. So I'm not familiar with pure workers comp because that's more like what they do is they pay you your lost wages and they pay you your medical bills. So medical bills obviously are money that goes to other people like doctors, nurses, hospitals, whatever. It doesn't go to you and lost wages go to you, but they're just like your salary or whatever your salary was. Now, in New York, you could also do a Section 32 where you get a lump sum. And then you stop getting the, the payments every like two weeks, but you get a lump sum. So I've seen those go for like, you know, a few hundred thousand, usually the lump sums. But if you're asking about a third party lawsuit, 
um, I would say that's worth more. And a micro discectomy de decompression, that could be that could be anywhere from like 500 to a million plus if it's a third party lawsuit, like in a car crash or in a slip and fall, trip and fall, something like that. Yeah, so that's usually what it is. And then Morali America says, is the lawyers ask $40 million? Hmm. I mean, yeah, if the case is worth it, you could you could ask for that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think like basically when you're doing a trial at the end of the trial and the closing or sometimes even in the opening statement, some lawyers do it in the opening. Just to be honest with the jurors, you could tell them what you think the case is worth. You could say, hey, this case is worth 40 million dollars. And let me explain to you why and add everything up like I have the economic loss. I have the lost wages, I have the pain and suffering, I have the loss of enjoyment of life. And when you add all that up together, it's worth $40 million. And you could even give examples, like some lawyers give examples of, you know, um, like a, a painting, a Mona Lisa, what is that worth? It could be worth a hundred million. Well, this is someone's life that was lost, right? Like a Picasso or a famous painting, or some people give other examples, like uh, they say, what, what would you do it, would would this person would my my client would would they agree right if if like we went for right before this crash happened and time got frozen and somebody came with a briefcase and said i'm going to give you whatever number 40 million dollars would you go through this would you have like all these fusions would you take a brain injury like an equal trade dollar value i'm sure they would say no i don't want that i'd, I'd rather just have my health you see but so that's a, another argument that some lawyers uh, make in closing argument. And then Alez says, how much do 99 cent stores insurance policies hold for premise liability, including reserves? Oh, OK. So each store would be different. It depends on what policy they bought. You know, like you could buy any kind of policy. Like if I had a 99 cent store, I could buy a policy for 10 million or I could buy a policy for, you know, a cheaper policy for one million or whatever. Usually I would say it's at least a million. But. Each case, you know, just like auto, some people have 25, some people have 250, some people have, you know, 1 million with 10 million excess or whatever. It could be anything. Um, recently, there was a case I was doing where there was a million and everybody thought there's only a million. And the lawyer who handled it before me, I actually called him up because he's been handling it for years and years. And I said, well, is there any excess or umbrella beyond the million? Because remember, there are different policies. So there's the primary policy that's the main policy but then there could be excess umbrella supplemental concurrent other policies right in addition to the million so he goes i don't even know i don't even care he didn't even ask so then i find out it took me like a long long time to find out but then i find out there's like 25 million in excess beyond the million so you know it just depends okay and then real tom jones says the truck attorney oh no we talked about that the truck attorney yeah and Shannon says, I had a laminectomy uh, in two places, plus I've had to change careers. What do you think I should settle for a ballpark? I mean, I couldn't really, you know, I don't want to like start throwing out numbers uh, willy nilly. It best, best to just text me 347-566-9595 because I'd have to know like what the case is about, you know, like what's the liability, what happened, when it happened, where it's uh, going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, laminectomy, I would say is usually worth, uh, it could be at the high six figures to the seven figures, meaning into the millions easily and having to change careers. I mean, if you have lost wages or if you have loss of enjoyment of life or change in your life that you could show through evidence through friends, family, coworkers. Yeah, it could be worth a lot. Okay. And then Morali says, if the lawyers ask for 40 million from the defense insurance, negotiation, how much the lawyer can get from the defense insurance approximately? I mean, again, it's the same thing. It's too general. I, I don't know. If you ask for 40 million, I mean, you wouldn't be asking for 40 million unless you thought that you could get 40 million. I don't know what you mean by ask. Like, do you mean like asking for 40 million, like on the phone, like calling them up and saying, hey, I think this is worth 40 million, like trying to settle it? You know, um, I mean, you have to, it'd have to be a real monster case uh, for them to you know, settle it for that much. That's a lot. Or if you mean like going to a trial and asking a jury, but the same thing, you know, even if you're asking a jury, you have to have 
the evidence. The case has to support it. You don't want to just go in there and say 40 million. I mean, there was an example. When I was on trial, when I got that uh, three and a half million dollar verdict, another lawyer, there's a place called the Lawyer's Lounge where all the lawyers kind of hang out. They read newspapers, they, uh, you know, whatever, uh, coffee, donuts, um, and they, they, they talk. And one of the lawyers came in there and he goes, this guy just got like, uh, he got beat up. He got a defense verdict. He was up there on the uh, eighth floor. I think this was in, in Brooklyn. And he was um, giving a closing argument. And in the closing argument for the first time, he asked for like 10 million. And he was trying to argue that there's like some kind of traumatic brain injury, but he didn't have the evidence. And he never asked the jury in, in the voir dire in the jury selection, whether they would agree to give you know millions of dollars. He never mentioned any numbers in opening statement. The uh, doctors, everything didn't really go so well for him. And only in closing argument, his final summation, he asked the jury for like 10 million and the jurors were like laughing. You know, that's just terrible. I feel bad for the guy. And then he got zero. So, you know, you can ask for anything, but you have to have the support. You know, you don't want to just go in there. You know, you know that that's the whole thing. It's not a lottery, right? It's compensation for fair compensation, reasonable compensation, just compensation for your injuries. That's what it's all about. So you have to have the support. But uh, Jermel says... That's why I switched to you. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to work that case up and get a, get a great result. And then Mr. Harrier says, pole and arm, ORIF, nerve surgery, TBI. Oh, wow. Yeah, future surgery. Yeah, I know. That's, that's a serious injury. How much are we talking ballpark, commercial insurance? I mean, I know. The, but the, the, yeah, I know. I know uh, this gentleman. Yeah, but you're in a different state, right? This is in, um, I believe, in the on the West Coast. So it could be. It could be. I mean, look, uh, I don't, you know, like I, I was saying earlier in the video, I was saying like, you know, procedures and diagnoses by themselves don't have value, right? It's the overall damage to the person, including, of course, the medical records, but it's everything, right? The, the loss of enjoyment of life. Um, it's the impact that it's had on your life. Everything. It's like a, um, it's the um, totality. So, I mean, it could be it could be worth into the millions, uh, definitely into the millions, nerve surgery. I think with that case, with your case, from, from what I remember, one of the issues is going to be liability. So if you prove liability, if you have a good like safety expert, engineer, you prove liability, you win liability, then then you're, you're golden, right? Because then the, you have the damages. The damages are worth millions and millions plus like, you know, so I think it's a liability question. Um. And then Anar says, my accident happened at an Amazon facility in New Jersey. Is Tyrax ownership taken into account in the compensation to be paid? Not sure what that means, Tyrax ownership. You mean the owner? Yeah, I mean, if the owner was at fault, um, if it happened in an Amazon facility, if, you, if Amazon was at fault, you sue Amazon. And then, um, you know, the owner, the landlord, if they're liable, then yeah, they would they would contribute to it, of course. The owner, as well as uh, you know, Amazon. If it's two different entities, you just sue whoever is is, is at fault, whoever is uh, liable. And then Morali says demand is forty million. Yes, okay, that's good, that's good. And then Ray said, yeah, great looking demand. Yeah, I mean, look, if the demand is forty million, that means it must be a really, really serious, life changing case. Um, you know, real serious, big case. Um, but yeah, good luck. I mean, hopefully you get that, uh, you get that, but always speak to your lawyer. Like what's the bottom line and what are you looking to get? Um, and then Ricey says liability is there. Yeah. I mean, I think so too, from what I remember about your case, I think you have the liability. It's just a question of whether they're going to pay you full value or whether they're going to discount because, you know, they could say, okay, we had a defective condition. We had an unsafe condition. But it was open and obvious, right? You should have been more careful. We think that a jury might give you a percentage, right? So they can say, okay, the defendant is like whatever, 60% at fault, but you're 40% at fault. Now, for every million dollars, you're only getting 60% um, of it. You're only getting 600000 See, so they could discount the, the final amount because of that. And then Shannon says $2 million in ad, uh, plus $2 million in excess. I've had a laminectomy, discectomy, and I had to change careers. Plus, my wife is suing. What do you think I should settle for ballpark? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say, look, the best thing to do is just text me the 347-566-9595 because like, that could give you a consultation. I could give you some ranges. I'm happy to do that. But um, like I said, let, let, the cases I've had with laminectomy, discectomy have gone for like at least 1.5, 1.7. I've had one case with a ceiling collapse. I believe that was like higher. That was 2.8. And then, so they're, they're all, they're all different, but it definitely could be, um, yeah, it definitely could be worth a lot. Yeah. If you text me, what I mean is like, you don't have to text me the whole story. You just text me like your name, uh, the facts, like, you know, one sentence facts about like what happened, um, your, your injury information and just text me your number. Well, well, yeah, and then I could just schedule, we could schedule a time to chat. We could just talk and then, you know, it's all confidential. Like I wouldn't, you know, if you have a lawyer, I wouldn't tell them or nobody would know anything about it. It's all confidential because you have an attorney client privilege. So, and then it's just give you a consultation, just try to help out. Um, but yeah, that sounds like, it sounds like it should be in the, in the millions. I mean, what is, what does your lawyer think? If you have a lawyer, what do they think about what it's worth? What are they saying? Because, you know, if they're handling the case, they have everything, right? They have all the pieces of the puzzle. So they should be able to give you uh, evaluation. So if they're not telling you, why are they not telling you? Is it because they don't want to set a goal for themselves? Like if they say a million, but then they get like 300,000, then they're going to feel bad or you're going to get mad at them. You see, there could be different reasons. I actually did a video about this. I did a video where I talked about why lawyers don't tell you what a case is worth. So you can take a look at that. I think it's in uh, YouTube. Okay, so sounds good. So thank you so much. We're almost, oh, we're at the hour mark already. Okay, I better run. Thank you so much, everyone. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what questions you have. We'll do another live, hopefully next week. Um, and then you could always uh, reach out to us. We are here for you. Our goal is helping serious injury victims and families. So, um, you know, we, we also will do a few last week tonight's where we read your questions or your comments, and I'll do some recorded ones where I answer some of the uh, comments on the channel. And we still are doing topic videos, whether it's about truck accidents, uh, premises liability, verdicts in different types of cases. I have access to a few new databases, so I'm going to take a look and maybe do a few more verdicts. So if you want certain verdicts and settlements. Uh, for a particular type of case, like a slip and fall case or uh, fusion or traumatic brain injury or burn or, you know, or a construction accident. I, I'm going to do a few of those. So, yeah, happy to happy to help. OK. Thank you so much. Have a great day and we will talk to you very soon. Stay safe out there. OK, bye bye.